Well, good evening, fellow Toastmasters in District 7. I am Fred Bergeron, your public relations manager, and I have a very special guest with me today. Her name is Pamela Winter. She is a distinguished Toastmaster and past district governor of District 83 in New Jersey and New York. She is also an award-winning photographer who also enjoys teaching the fine arts of becoming a better photographer. She is a founding member of Lens Masters Advanced Toastmasters in District 84, where she delivers photography speeches and offers feedback to others seeking to better their craft, whether it's Toastmasters or photography. Mind you, everybody, she will also be 21 in five days. Please welcome to the virtual lectern, my friend, distinguished Toastmaster, Pamela Winter. Thank you, Fred. It is an honor to be here with you. I'm very excited to present for District 7, my friends on the West Coast. I am a native Californian, and I lived in the Columbia River Gorge in Washington, so I know that we're covering all of this area, and I get to see all my old, old friends from way back. What I'd like to do is talk to you about the camera that everyone has in their back pocket or their pocketbook, and we carry it with us for every single occasion. Most of our pictures look like they belong on Facebook. There are a few ways to learn how to take better cell phone photography so that you can enter them into competitions or be really proud to show your friends the work that you can do with this magical little box that fits in your pocket. So I'm going to go into a presentation I have right now. If you will bear with me, I'm going to take you through a little trip around the world, well, around the US. Oh, now, what do you think all those pictures have in common? Yes, they were all taken with a cell phone camera. And to me, I think that that's just fun. So what? there are five elements of a good photo. It must be in focus. It must be properly exposed. You should have good composition. You'll want to tell a story with your picture, and that's done through your subject matter and any post-processing. For those of you who say that post-processing isn't necessary, I like a picture that's just as it was taken, I'll tell you post-processing is necessary because the camera's vision is not as good as your eyes. So let's start with focus. You can hand hold your camera. You can support it on a tripod or a horizontal platform with a vertical support. You want to engage your focus lock. Be careful with your zoom and go to wide angle. Now I'll be talking mostly about an Apple phone, an iPhone, because that's what I use. I do know that other photographers who do not use an iPhone have just as good of a camera in their phone, whether it's an Android or a Samsung or a Huawei. There are great cameras being manufactured in cell phones. Now, let's go to how to focus with your camera. And that is very easy. Compose your picture on your screen and then just touch. Leave your finger there for a while. 
and you will engage the auto exposure and auto focus lock. It's a little yellow square on your screen and you will see it when you remove your finger from the screen, things within that yellow square should be in focus because you've just told the camera what you want in focus by touching that little square. And that's pretty easy. I Not to dial in your focus camera, but to just touch the screen, it works very well. Now you can hold your camera upright. You can hold it sideways. You can pinch to zoom, unpinch to unzoom. But what? let's talk about that focus, autofocus and auto exposure. There is something in your camera, in the app, that you should engage, and that is the grid lines. Go to your camera app within your phone, and you'll see something that says grid lines, turn them on. That will help with your composition. In the meantime, we know how to focus. Touching that screen will always work. So now we're gonna talk about exposure, a dark, subject with a light background results in silhouettes. That means that any kind of detail that you wanted in the foreground is going to be blown out. It's not going to show. It will be in shadow. This is not a well-exposed picture. It's a funny one, but you can see outside the window just perfectly, while everything inside looks rather dark. So how do you fix it? You want to lighten it up with your auto exposure? A light subject with an even lighter background is going to give you blown highlights. And that's not a good look for your picture either. All that beautiful greenery outside that window is just faded to white. So how do you fix that? Well, you go into your camera app and you turn on your HDR. That stands for high dynamic range. What will happen is that your camera will take three pictures. It will take an overexposed one, it will take an underexposed one, and it will take one that it thinks is right on the money. And then it will combine them. That, to me, is just magic. It's absolute magic. What does that look like? Not the best, but certainly the best of what we saw between the two pictures that I showed you earlier. So let's talk about exposure. Remember that little yellow box that you put your finger on? That checked your focus. It also checks your exposure. Who knew? When you remove your finger, you'll see a little icon of a sun next to that yellow box. And you can move that sun up for more light or down for less light. You can adjust your exposure spot to suit the picture that you want to take. You'll turn on your HDR function that will take all three of those pictures. Now, when you do that, you have an option to either keep the original or discard the original. You might want to keep the original if you have room in your camera's memory to do that. Otherwise, you might want to offload it into a, uh, a memory storage and discard it from your camera, from your phone. So how do we check that exposure? 
there's that auto exposure, auto focus lock. Turn on your HDR, keep or discard the original. Now, do we understand about autofocus and auto exposure? I'm hoping so because there will be a question and answer period at the end. If you have something, write it down and we will cover it. Next, I want to move to composition. A picture that is well composed is going to be so much more interesting than one that is dead center or does not follow the rules of composition, of which there are many, we're going to touch on one or two of them. One is the rule of thirds. And it is pretty elementary when it comes to taking pictures. What that does is divide your screen three lateral, three up and down, so that you have nine equal squares. And then compose your main subject on any of the adjoining in intersecting lines. Or you can just turn on the grid lines in your camera app and it will show you that you'll want to align your subject in any of those one, two, three, four intersecting lines. This is a picture that is superimposed with those intersecting lines and you will see that the horizon falls exactly on that top third line with the sun almost reaching that juncture of the meeting of the lines, but solidly within one of those squares. But now let's talk about subject matter. It's just like Toastmasters. If you are creating a speech, you're telling a good story. A prize-winning speech tells an exceptional story. A prize-winning photo also tells an exceptional story. If you're photographing a sunset, and a lot of people do because it's beautiful, you want to capture it, you want to never forget it. But let's add something to that picture that allows you to see where you are, some interest to the picture. Tell a story. That's right. You're going to tell a Toastmaster story with your picture. So that's a sunset. What about people? Add a human interest. Tell a story. Once again, superimpose in your mind that rule of thirds and you will see that the man's body is online in that right hand section and the motorcycle is on the lower one third line. Scenery, tell a story, fill the frame. Nothing in this picture or rather everything in this picture is needed to tell this story. The foreground trees, the bridge, the rain that you see against the bridge. This is a beautiful picture of, of uh, New England. I lost it, there it goes. And that is the, the most photographed covered bridge in the United States, it crosses the Connecticut River. So there are several photo editing apps for your cell phone. 
because I said, remember in the beginning, every picture must be processed. There is a native or built-in editing for your pictures. Snapseed is an app that is free. It's owned by Google. It is on the NIC, N-I-K, photographing platform. It's a very robust editing app, and it's free. VSCO is free. It's got a little deeper learning curve, but if you like having the ability to take care of your photos the way you want them done rather than uh, uh, an app that gives you several options of what they think is better, then go to VSCO because that will allow more freedom for you. Now, these prices are pretty old. So a slow shutter cam, I believe, is now $5.00. Six, maybe more. Pro camera, I know, is $12. Lightroom CC, that's classic Lightroom for mobile devices. Add it to your phone, is free. That's Adobe Lightroom. There are photo editing software for your computer. What I do is I take the photos out of my phone and put them into my computer where I can manipulate them even more. And then there's Adobe Photoshop. Photoshop Elements is more for the beginner. It does takes you through three stages of editing. You can use their editing or they will guide you on the edits or it will take you through advanced editing. I used Photoshop Elements for years before I graduated to Adobe Photoshop where I felt comfortable enough with what I was doing with my edits that I could now take control of them all. Adobe Lightroom is good. If you have a lot of pictures that need editing, such as oh, shooting a wedding or a bar mitzvah or a christening, you load them into Lightroom and it makes your life a lot easier. And as I said, I did this a long time ago. And at that time, Photo Lemur was good. On One is good. I know Fred uses On One, and I think he also uses something else. So now I do have time for those questions if that's what you are interested in, I'll take the questions. Thank you, Pam. We have a guest on, Elios. Um, he may put his questions in the chat because he's at work. But yes, I played around with On One and I use something called Luminar. I use AI and I use Neo. I like both of them. Nothing against Adobe. I like using Photoshop Express. Now, it's not as in-depth as Elements, but you can also use it on your phone. And I like to tell people if you're going to at least take photos with your phone, you need to do some basic editing. Like if your exposure is not right, like you talked about earlier, you can easily fix your exposure in, in Photoshop. And I know that the iPhone has a native editing App. I use an Android phone. The Google Pixel has its own native app, and you can do a little bit in Google Photos, too, but I found out with the Google Photos, you can only do the editing on a mobile device. You can't do it on a computer. So that was one thing I found out. How long have you been doing photography? A long time. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, in a few days, I'll be old. 21. <laughs> yeah, again. <laughs> and I have been shooting probably since I'm 12 or 13. So we're looking at close to 65 years. And what got you interested in photography? I've always been interested in the arts. I 
I used to paint, I used to draw oil pastels, and then I found a camera. My first camera, I have to tell you, was about this big, and it was made out of cardboard, black cardboard. It was a brownie box camera, a Kodak, not a brownie, before brownies, Kodak box camera. And I shot black and white film, but I took it with me everywhere. And it, it didn't take bad pictures. It just wasn't as sophisticated as the cameras today. Was that considered a pinhole camera? No. No, okay. it, it probably two steps up from a pinhole. <laughs> okay. Because I, I learned it. I, I took a photography class with a photography club back in Georgia, and someone was talking about a pinhole camera. I went, well, that's a cool concept. Yeah. I took that with me to the Seattle World's Fair in 1962. So my next question is, a lot of people have cell phones, like you said, the, the majority of the population does. Now, just because people have a phone and they take photos, do you think that makes them a photographer? They like to call themselves a photographer. I shot, I was a professional photographer shooting weddings. I was not, it, weddings are not a repeat business. You, you, you sell yourself once, people assume they're only going to get married once. <laughs> so it's, it's not a repeat business. You have to sell yourself on the quality and then people want pricing. They say, oh, well, you're only going to be there for four hours, so... How about $500? Well, they don't talk about the hours that I spend scoping out the venue or the plans that I make where I look to see what time of day it is, the light coming in the windows, the light outside, the time of year it is. I shoot engagement photos. And then they they don't look at the time that I spent downloading the pictures, um, culling them, and post processing. I had one woman that was she was a very large woman, and she thought that I could take a hundred pounds off of her with Photoshop. And she wanted a thousand pictures that I took with every one of them doctored to do that. If that had been the case, I would probably be still editing them. Yes, been there, been there, done that. So my next question, Pam, is with wedding photography, and I used to be in real estate, and real estate, do you think it's appropriate to take photos with a cell phone? You know, there's, there's a lot of attachments that can go on the camera backs in, in cell phones. There are a lot of adjustments that can be made on your cell phone to take really good pictures. I sold a house in New Jersey. And the woman came with a regular SLR and a tripod and shot the pictures on a 10 millimeter camera with a 10 millimeter lens because the rooms were large. She wanted to get it from wall to wall and everything in between. And sometimes you cannot do it without parallax error on a cell phone. Parallax error are those converging lines. When you see it, it's kind of like a, a fisheye lens, but not quite. If the camera is not level, the uprights will, will fall in or fall out. That's, that's a parallax error, and it is not attractive for real estate photography. If you know how to use a cell phone to avoid that, then 
use a cell phone. If a big camera is too heavy to carry around, then invest in a mirrorless camera, which is a lot lighter and takes far superior pictures. Yes, cell I, have, mm -hmm. I have. So, I have both. And I was in a situation before as a realtor, I was also taking uh, listing photos for a friend of mine. And I had a challenge with one of the bathrooms. It was just real narrow. And I just, I could not get the right shot with my DSLR. So I played around with my cell phone with different angles. And I had a little mini tripod. So I put it on the floor and angled it. I was able to take better pictures of that bathroom with my cell phone than with my DSLR. But mm -hmm. all the other photos I could take with my DSLR. So I really think it depends on your environment, your situation. Because I always tell people, Pam, from a professional perspective, you're not paying for the equipment. You're paying for the end result. And a lot mm -hmm. of times, based on what you said with your settings, if you know your settings, your exposure, and things like that, people aren't going to know the difference unless you tell them. They're literally not going to know the difference. So what do you yeah. think about that? Well, you can go on to Zillow and look at all of the houses for sale. Which ones are you going to spend time actually looking at the pictures? The professionally taken pictures are the, are the houses that sell faster because they're more attractive because the photographer knows how to adjust the lighting either pre or post. They know how to adjust the camera angles when they're taking these pictures. And I don't care if you're taking it with a cell phone or with a DSLR. If you're a professional photographer and you know what you're doing, that house is going to sell a lot faster with the right pictures. Yes. And really, isn't that what a realtor wants? Right. And and I think it's the same with photos in general, Pam. It's just, it's a lot of common sense. You know, you don't need a cell phone camera or a DSLR if there's clutter in the house. You know, remove the clutter. You know, a DSLR or a cell phone camera is not going to make the difference and fix that clutter. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's all about common sense. Just like when you were talking about composition, you know, one of the most common things is something behind the head. And it looks like it's attached to their head. You don't have to have a special camera for that. It's all about common sense. If people don't realize that, you know, is 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 I think think before you shoot is kind of like what I like well, to say. Yeah, a a good photographer will check the entire frame, not just the subject. You're looking at a subject, and we've all seen those things on Facebook where a dog photo bombs the wedding pictures by mm -hmm. using the, mm -hmm. the lawn behind him as his toilet. And it just, come on, just, just check from front to back and side to side. Everything is going to be recorded. So do a good job. Okay. Well, thank you, Pam. And do you have any Final words, words of wisdom for those aspiring photographers, whether they use their cell phone or not, on how to be better photographers, whether they get paid or not. Yes, I do. And I will tell you, I've been taking pictures for, like I said, almost 65 years. I've seen a lot of cameras come and go. I've seen a lot of trends come and go. Always be learning. Always take the time to learn the new trends, to learn the new cameras, to learn what it is you're taking a picture of and, and learn how to do it better. Because the better you are, the more your pictures are going to be seen. Always be learning. Keeps you young too. Yes. I hear you, Pamela. I feel the same way. I'm always learning. I feel I'm a decent photographer, but I learn every time I take photos. I've learned a lot from you, and it's, I learn a lot just from looking at the photos going, wow, okay, 
you know, I should have done this better, or that's why I usually take more than one photo. Because out of, let's say I take 10 photos, one of the 10 is bound to be better out of out of all of them. Or someone's got their eyes closed, or someone sneezed, or like you said, the dog photo bombs someone in the picture. You know, out of those 10, I'm bound to get one or two good ones. You know, I, I spent a lot of time working on a newspaper, and at that point, I had one camera, one roll of film, and three assignments for the day. And I had to take all of those assignments and fit them into 12 frames. That means you take one picture and it better be good because okay. that was the only one you got to, to take for. Yes, I hear you. That's, that's really when you have to, like you said, look at your frame and really be careful about that. Well, Thank you, Pam. Before we wrap up, I'm going to announce our next guest, who you may know. Our next guest is going to be past District Director Becky McGilton from District 84, who will be telling us about Meetup on February the 13th. So stay tuned if you want to learn more about Meetup. Tune in same bat time, same bat channel. I'm Fred Bergeron, signing off as your public relations manager. Thank you once again, Pam Winter for gracing us with your presence and educating us on cell phone photography. And I will say good night and peace out, everybody. Bye-bye.